While it is true that these emigrants were the cream of the Atlantean race, it should be remembered that the thickness and richness of cream is dependent upon the quality of the milk, and there was little milk of human kindness in Atlantis. In fact, the people were so degenerate, the occult records say, that the planetary spirits had almost determined to let the entire race be destroyed, bodies and souls, and to attempt the creation of a better race of men. But one of the great gods volunteered to assume the burden of redeeming the people, so far as it was possible to do. The others consented to his ablation, and, by selecting the best of the Atlanteans, for the seed of a higher civilization, he commenced his efforts in behalf of humanity. This is not very complimentary to present humanity, when it is remembered that it is the reincarnation of the Atlanteans, but analysis of the present so-called civilization may give additional weight to the occult records referred to, as well as show how slowly men evolve in thousands of years. The selection of this body of men, for preservation, gave rise to the tradition of a chosen people, and, in sentiment, if not in actual terms, has been carefully cultivated by all subsequent nations. As the itinerants journeyed through northwest Africa, they met a semi-barbaric, nomadic tribe, which they pressed into service as burden-bearers, and this tribe, in time, became the Jewish race, and, were it not for similar incidents constantly repeated in history, it would seem almost incredible that men, who had fought for their own freedom, would, at the first opportunity, enslave others. By reason of their numerical strength, their warlike training and their knowledge of the use of occult forces, it was easy for the escaped Atlanteans to hold in subjection the less developed Jews. The Atlantean leader, who, for convenience, will be called Moses, though that did not become his name until a subsequent incarnation, was able, by his knowledge of magic, to not only awe the Jews, but also to continue his authority over his own people. During the balance of the Great Exodus, the evolutionary position of the Jews was similar to that of the Negro in America, prior to his enfranchisement. The close association of an inferior race, with a superior one, always quickens the evolution of the lower but debases the higher and where the association is that of master and slave, grave individual wrongs frequently arise which further entangle the threads of destiny. One of the chief defects in the character of humanity is the desire to get something for nothing, and every man, through self-examination, can gauge his own evolutionary growth by finding out how far that human weakness has been supplanted in him. By a sense of justice, by the desire to make reciprocity a rule in his life. Slavery, either physical or industrial, is the result of a national effort to get something for nothing, and slavery always engenders compensatory consequences. The law of equilibrium manifests ethically, as compensation, and mankind learns this truth slowly, as the history of the United States testifies. The Pilgrim Fathers came to America to gain their liberty. An unfriendly climate and a barren soil made living precarious for new engenders, and, as soon as was possible, they turned to trade. It was not long before some of them became slave hunters, traders, and importers. The friendly soil and climate of the South Atlantic states developed a social, intellectual, and leisure class, who looked to Mother Earth for sustenance and wealth. The natures of the Southerners, in conjunction with the nature of their soil, produced a market for slaves. The existence of the economic conditions, North and South, again created slavery, and the fratricidal war in the States was not the only compensation which the nation had to make for its error, costly as that war had been. The manhood and womanhood, of the South, had been lowered by its something-for-nothing policy, and, when thrown upon its own endeavors, required a generation to revive. The foundation of the corruption of American political life was laid in wartime and in the decade following. Wealth made, directly and indirectly, through slavery and its resultant war, went into new avenues and became the foundation of an industrial slavery as vicious as the preceding one had been. 
Greed is never cured by gluttony, but by starvation and, as the cure has never yet been tried, the fallacious circle still repeats itself. But, many wrongs never made a right, and, as the Atlantean civilization was destroyed by slavery, so, in some manner, must perish the vaunted, but false, civilization of the twentieth century. But it is not only nationally and internationally that people suffer for their greed and sequential economic errors, but the law of compensation works also in individual cases. The occult records show that in almost every case, Negro outrages, so common in former years, in all the states of the Union, were not alone due to the animal impulse of the black men, but were also due to the fact that the violated white person, in a prior life, had either enslaved the offending black man, tearing him from his African home and family, or had inflicted a similar cruelty upon him when he was enslaved. And it is further known to occultists, that many of the men who have been leaders of the Negroes were, formerly, white men who were compelled to incarnate in black bodies to suffer the sorrows of slavery, which they, themselves, had instituted, and to help the colored race upward in its evolution, as compensation for former wrongs done to it. Nor must it be forgotten that industrial slavery is but another phase of the same question, and that equitable adjustment is made, periodically, by the law of compensation in every such case, as the former history of France and the more recent history of Russia and of Europe so eloquently testify. America is merely cited as an example of the compensation which follows slavery, because the event is of such comparatively recent date, but the same law applied to all people and nations, where similar conditions existed, as was anciently illustrated in the case of the Jews and the Atlanteans. When seventy years had passed, after the beginning of their exodus, the Atlanteans arrived at the Red Sea, and but few individuals, who started, ever reached the promised land. Moses was among those who failed to finish the journey, but, before excarnating, he had organized a strong army and had established a permanent priesthood. He had also formulated laws which governed the Egyptians until the wills of the later kings superseded them. At the end of their journey, the Jews were not released, but, as both masters and slaves increased in numbers, they were held in a more restricted slavery and their burdens became heavier as the years rolled by. Continuously their prayers for freedom ascended to the gods, and then, once more, the wheel of rebirth revolved and brought back, into earth life, the original participants in the exodus from Atlantis, the weaker egos once more incarnated in Jewish bodies, the stronger as offspring of the dominant Egyptians. In time all desires are fulfilled, but divine justice, in order to give the Jews the liberty they craved, had to raise up a leader for the new exodus. As Moses had enslaved the Jews, he was required, by the law of compensation, to incarnate as the son of a Jewish slave to make restitution, by enfranchising those whom he had wronged in his prior incarnation. His education at Pharaoh's court revived his prior knowledge and power and his old ambition for leadership again dominated him. He had all the latent qualifications and the experiences to enable him to conduct a second exodus. As an adopted son of Pharaoh's daughter, his ambition to rule could not be gratified and it naturally sought expression elsewhere. The slave blood, within him, suggested the most logical plan and he set himself about preparing for his new mission, since a long and careful preparation was necessary for so great an undertaking. The Occidental conception of a genius is unfortunate for it is both misleading and detrimental. To say an individual has uncommon power of intellect, because of heredity, or a gift from God, is to make a precocious, but vain person, especially a child, feel that he has been endowed with a mental aptitude that does not require self-effort to develop. He considers his ability a gift and, possessing what he has not earned, he neglects his native ability and acquires the habit of craving something else for nothing. The occult view is that a genius is a person who has a natural aptitude along any line of study, 
or endeavor, because he has acquired it, by hard work, in a prior incarnation, that God does not unjustly shower talents on one person which he, unfairly, denies to another, but that all ability is self-acquired through effort in some life. No effort is ever lost, and the plotter of today may, with confidence, look to the tomorrow knowing that his unfulfilled ambitions will surely be realized. Moses knew this occult truth and shaped his life accordingly. His accomplishments, therefore, were many and consistent and have excited the admiration of the world. He was preeminent as a maker and a codifier of laws, and while it is true that they were formulated for his own time and people, yet, by reason of their excellence, some of his laws are as applicable to the twentieth century as they were to his own period. And this is true because many of them are based upon ethical principles and, consequently, cannot die. It is often hard to distinguish just where the civic regulations cease and the moral mandate commences, so nicely blended are the political decrees with natural law. During their years of slavery, the Jews had been largely influenced by the exoteric religion of their masters, and had lost, if they ever possessed, all esotericism. From his great knowledge of men and of morals, Moses formulated a religion, for his followers, which was adapted to their comprehension and yet, was infinitely superior and more elevating than that which they possessed. But, to the priesthood which he established, he gave his knowledge of magic and such little esotericism as he knew, which, in later times, became the basis of the Kabbalah. As an organizer and builder of state, Moses was unsurpassed, for he took a disorganized, hopeless and helpless race of slaves and welded them into a nation. His task was no easy one, because the Egyptians looked askance at him for his activity among the Jews, and his own people distrusted him because of his aristocratic environment and friends. He, therefore, left the court and proceeded to the wilderness where he became a herdsman, and, in the long asterisk hours of his watch, he practiced concentration, perfected his plans and made himself proficient in his old art of magic. As in his previous life he had awed the Jews through his magical power, he determined to use it again to dominate them. It was a part of both kingcraft and priestcraft, which he had well learned in more than one life, to claim vicegerency under Almighty God, in order to receive the reverence and obedience of the masses. And so he adopted this simple method in his work, and, because of his ability to produce phenomena, his claim was easily established. Whenever he saw his authority waning, he resorted to the old expedient of calling upon God, publicly, to reaffirm the divine right of chosen leaders. And when the Jews became restless or rebellious, Moses threatened them with the anger of Jehovah, and thus ruled them through their fears. He was a martinet, with his own people and a despotic conqueror of others. Through his influence at court and his magic, he succeeded, finally, in getting the second exodus started, but the occult records do not coincide with the biblical ones as to this second emigration. The Jewish historians drew largely upon their imaginations in writing their anabasis, they filched the legends of the first exodus and attributed them to the second, just as they appropriated and mutilated the Chaldean records to form their genesis. Moses, himself, deceived his people about many of his so-called miraculous experiences, that are reported in the Bible as having happened to him in the mountains and at the court of Pharaoh, and these tales, being believed, passed as historical facts. There was no question about his ability as a leader, an organizer, a lawgiver, a nation-builder, a religion maker and a magician. Nor was there any doubt about his defects of character, as both the exoteric and esoteric records disclose. But the latter reveal the fact that when Moses left his followers, on their journey, he crept away and died, like a wounded animal, alone in the mountains, leaving the younger priests to paint his transfiguration. As a further study in the law of compensation, the second exodus is fascinating in its illumination of subsequent history. 
Moses and his followers believed that they were the chosen people of the Almighty, and that everything upon the earth should be given to them, that if what they desired were not given, then it should be taken. Acting upon this aggressive and acquisitive racial trait, formulated into a religious belief, they commenced with despoiling the Egyptians and continued it with all the tribes of people which they contacted throughout their itinerancy from Egypt to Canaan, and under their judges and kings. It is not necessary to resort to occult history to confirm these facts, as the Jewish records disclose them. They also narrate the facts that the Jews contacted many tribes and nations in their journeyings, who were barbarians and inferior in every way to themselves. Many of these tribes, the Jews wantonly warred upon because of the difference in their religious belief. Many entire tribes were annihilated without cause, through mere blood lust and greed. Throughout the greater part of the Orion Age, or for two thousand years before Christ, the Jews were a dominant, aggressive, tyrannical, political power. During the Piscean Age, or the two thousand years since the time of Christ, the Jews have been a race, rather than a nation, a despoiled and persecuted people in many countries. To most thinking people it is not an adequate explanation of the status of the Jew, during Christian times, to attribute it to the alleged crucifixion of the Nazarene by a Jewish mob inflamed by the priests. The occultist would say that the despoiling of the Jews, throughout Europe, was due to the fact that the ancient Hebrews, reincarnated, had again met with those egos whom they despoiled in ancient days and were making unwilling compensation to them and that the massacres of the Jews in Russia, in recent years, and throughout the world in Christian times, were done by the same egos, again incarnated, who were mercilessly slaughtered by the Jews during the rule of their judges and kings. Thus, are men tied together by their thoughts and acts, and it is not merely a code of ethics but a truth founded on natural law, which the greatest of the Jews enunciated when he said, Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged, and with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. Thanks for watching the Wisdom Rocker. Don't forget to like, comment, and share.